welcome to TLC, where we dive into the heart of our local community. It's wineries, restaurants, business, and real estate. I'm Troy Anderson, your host, along with Pamela, my co-host. And we're here to bring you a new perspective on what's happening in our community. This week, we also have a special guest. Still I, is on. Yeah, Isaac Schmidt, owner and winemaker of Sin Cellars. Isaac, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. Did I say all that right? I, yeah, you nailed it. Nailed it. Oh, gosh. I love the name of the winery. I know. Sin Cellars. It's S-Y-N-N-E. Mm-hmm. But still, yeah. Sin Cellars. Sin yeah. Cellars. Yeah. Gotcha. I, people ask me all the time, is it sin or sign? And I, I usually have to say it's sin, like the naughty way. And <laughs> I'll get a, I'll get a stink eye or a giggle, one of the two. Oh, yeah. I like it. That's why I like it. It's like, oh, it could go either way, right? Yeah. <laughs> you brought us two great wines today. We got uh, one open already. It's a 2020 100% Columbia Valley Tempranillo, which is a Spanish varietal. Yep. And. Um, uh, we're going to dive right into sipping on success, right, yes, Pamela? Yes, we are. Yeah, normally that's my bit. I'm just I so know. excited to try yeah. something different. Okay, so um, you said it's a Spanish varietal, and this is one that's not really prevalent around this area. Am I correct in that? Assumption? Yeah, it, there's just less of it planted. Okay. Right. It doesn't fit into, uh, I think, many wineries programs and winemaking okay. programs. A lot, of our, a lot of our area seems to focus on Bordeaux and Rhones a lot. Mm-hmm. Is that because most of the uh, wineries or you know, where the grapes are grown are kind of on the same latitude as Bordeaux, France? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. That's, okay. that's fairly accurate. Okay. I learned something on this show right at the beginning. Yeah, you're doing <laughs> I'm great. Gonna, I'm going to bring out my bits, you know, of knowledge when I can. All right. So let's take a look at this before we dive in. Cheers, it's nice Isaac. And dark. Cheers, yeah. you guys. Thanks very much for coming on the show. All right. Let's take a look at this. So color-wise, it's it's rich looking mm. Troy's just dive straight in. yeah sorry I just Isaac, jumping no, Isaac's in. the expert he's giving it a good twirl I'm pretending I know what I'm doing <laughs> I'm just giving it a little aeration <laughs> all right what do we think all right it's got a beautiful bouquet it smells really really good mm. and it's this one kind of hits the side of my tongue it Both does sides a little bit yeah not me no no well that's why mm-hmm. everyone's different well, we talked about this before, didn't we? That mm. the, there's no one right way to, to kind of describe the wine because everyone's palate's different. So, what are you getting from it? I'm getting a lot of fruit. A lot of fruit. There's, on that. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of ripe red fruit. Yeah. Um, right down the middle, initially around the edges, I, I get some of that French oak coming out. Yeah, for sure. Coming out around the edges. Dries mm-hmm. out the edge of my tongue. Yeah. I um. Doesn't dry at the edge of my tongue at all. I kind of get it right smack in the middle of my tongue, right. and it's not super dry, which I like. Um, not that there's anything wrong with a really dry in wine, but this one is just really kind of soft. has a soft finish to it. It's it's a little mellow, but not kind of. It's not flat at all. It's just you know, there's you just want to keep. Okay, let me have another sip of this and and see what I'm getting from it. Um, yeah, bouquet wise, what are you getting from this, Troy? I mean, Isaac can tell us all of the details because he made it. But. Right well, it's got a great smell. There's no, uh, sometimes when you open a bottle of wine, especially when you freshly open it, it has some astringent smells to it, mm-hmm. but it, it tastes fine. So this right. smells great and tastes fine. Um, nice and fresh and bright. Um, it's darker than most Tempranillos that I'm used to. Is that? You know, the, I've I've had Tempranillos range the spectrum from like really really light and fruity and just kind of fun and and um, innocuous to like very very dark and brooding, oh, yeah. and you know ranging in price from uh, you get you probably find some Tempranillos or Riojas that are you know twelve thirteen dollars from Spain that are just right. like I said they they don't have a lot of substance behind them they're just kind of light and fruity, so um, and everywhere in between mine's probably somewhere in the middle. Rioja, if you're buying a Spanish wine, that's Tempranillo grape. For the most part, yeah. Okay. There's some other stuff in there sometimes, but... Got it. What I love about um, Isaac's has a tasting room here in Woodenville, and we went down and, and checked you, you guys out, and you had this great um, map of tastes on the oh, wall. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, I can describe, oh, yeah. it's like all the potential things... I was going to buy that. I, I took a photo. Did I just you? said oh. I could, yeah. <laughs> I'm always short on words when it comes to describing... Mm-hmm. The flavors yeah. of a wine, and it's—I thought it was fascinating the amount of different flavors that you can pull from a wine, things that you wouldn't expect, like leather and tobacco. Not that we're getting any of that from this no. wine, um, but just the different fruits that you can taste in that. That you know, 
and maybe a little unexpected. I'm getting a little bit of cherry from this cherry, one. Cherry, yeah. Um, I don't know if that's intentional, but um, right kind of in the middle. And it's it's that bridge between a soft and a tart cherry. It's it's just it's delicious. Thank you. Yeah, there's uh, the, the the cherry flavor is is I think prominent in a lot of a lot of red wines. It seems to be that uh, the the tempranillo that we have right here is. I try not to like pin it into one in one or two fruits because like mm -hmm. like we said it everybody tastes things a little bit different yeah so um i just broadly said ripe red fruit down the middle mm -hmm. some of the stuff that i get would maybe be uh like overripe strawberry or overripe raspberry um mm. uh, maybe a little bit of dark cherry uh -huh. in there yeah, um, i, I don't that. think it leans towards like blackberry and like dark bramble as much mm -hmm. but um yeah it's I would agree with that. I mean, we've tasted quite a few wines on this show yeah. now, and each of them are very individual. And um, there's definitely some that you would call them chewy, maybe. I would call them a little jammy. Chewy is a little more uh, tannic. Okay. Yeah. 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 This is definitely not that. This is no, really kind of soft. Very approachable. And, yeah. Very. Kind of silky. And it's still, I, I kind of describe it as like soft and feminine. Yeah. If that's, yeah. A, if that's like just kind of pretty and nuanced and like it's kind of a softer mouthfeel. Mm -hmm. Just. I hate to use the word smooth, but that seems to be a word that many people resonate mm -hmm. with. Smooth jazz. Smooth jazz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why I kind of go without sulky. But I kind of, I, I, I kind of understand why you're saying it has a little feminine feel to it. Not that it's, we're saying it's a drink for just women, but it just sure. have it has that little softness, kind of you know, round the edges, a little balance. I can see pairing it with a lot of things. Mm -hmm. We're going to yeah. talk about food again. <laughs> Our poor, poor Pam. <laughs> one of the one of the things I really love about this tempranillo is that uh, because it's the the weight, and by that I mean the the perceived mouthfeel, the mm -hmm. the or the perceived density of it in your while you're having a sip of it, is a bit more medium in body. Mm -hmm. I think that it's it, it makes it very very food friendly. Yeah. Um, where or. Uh, also, if you uh, like summertime foods, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, if it's a really, really warm day outside, it might be a little bit easier to drink than like a, like a big cab or a big Merlot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can Just see that. Th yeah. They can be kind of stifling mm -hmm. sometimes. Yeah, if this you... does have a lightness to it. Yeah. 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 I can see the wine attaching to the proteins and bringing out even more flavors. Yeah. Like cheeses that's and Well, that's the like first that. time I've ever had that varietal. Really? Yeah. Oh. This is your first time for now? Mm-hmm. Oh, yep. Awesome. Well, I probably had a taste at your, Cheers. but like, like a proper, like, good. A proper tasting. A proper tasting. I was like, gotcha. okay, I'm gonna sit and enjoy this. You guys can just talk, and I'm just gonna sit here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ready. I'm gonna do some work, but um, that's great. And while I'm looking at the glass, I'm I'm looking at mine, but I'm also looking at Isaac's across the way from me, and the legs on that. Um, it stands up. Huh? It really does stand yeah, up. Yeah. You know, I've not seen one quite, you know, with legs quite that. That's the viscosity. Yes. Maybe I don't, I don't know. know. Maybe he calls it something different. No, it's that's exactly what I say. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's it, it's an in, viscosity is an indication of what it's going to be like in mm -hmm. in my mouth. That's kind of how how I interpret the legs when I see you know if if and when they form, how they form, how wide they are, um, or how fast the the drop the drip, drops, yeah. the drip drops, the drip drops um, down the side of the glass. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the uh, yeah, to me, it's just an in, an indication of what it's going to be like in my mouth. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I think this is all really fascinating. I've, I've come from a place where I like wine, but I knew nothing about it before we started this podcast. And I feel like, you know, I still know nothing really, but I feel like I'm you're, learning. You're learning a lot. Learning a lot about, yeah. you know. Um, What's the coolest thing you've learned so far? Oh my gosh, I don't know. Um, there's been so much kind of, um, you know, kind of like the viscosity, you know, looking at those, the fact that we call them legs and that, that that's an indicator of how, I don't want to say thick it's going to be, but you know, how it's going to feel on the tongue. Um, that's fascinating to me. But all the different varietals, really, I think is probably um, one of the most fascinating things for me. I mean, I've, from the accent, you can all tell I'm not from here. Um, so I grew up with a different kind of wine, right? So, um, but the fact that there is, you know, Bordeaux style, and then we've got something else that's Spanish style. And, you know, I really didn't give it much thought until we started this podcast about all the different yeah, you know, I just drank it. I mm. opened it and drank it and enjoyed it, yeah. which is what you're supposed to do. Right. But um, yeah, and as we get into our conversation more, you know, in the next segment when we talk about your wines, there's some fascinating things I found out from Isaac as well. So um, yeah. yeah, it's a good segue. It, 
I'm here, we yeah. here we go. Here we go. All right. So on that note, we're going to take a really quick break, and when we come back, we're going in. We're going to dive into the the other bottle of wine that Isaac brought with us, but we're also going to dig into Isaac, his journey, and um, his winery as a All whole. All about his winery. Yep. Right on. All right. So stay tuned. We'll be right, right back, back after this really short break. This podcast is brought to you by Vaughn's One Thousand Spirits Gusto Bistro. in the market for a new home or looking to sell your current one, Tend Home Team is here to help. As community-focused real estate agents, we are dedicated to providing personalized service and support throughout the entire process. Whether you're a first-time home buyer or a seasoned pro, we've got you covered. Let us take the stress out of your real estate journey. Contact us today at Tend Home Team and learn more about our services. Welcome back to TLC Tend Life Community Podcast. We're here with Isaac from Sin Cellars, and we're just going to dive right in. I think that's Ask a good him idea. A, yeah, let's just. Isaac, oh, can you share with us it. and our listeners the story behind Sin Cellars and what inspired you to become a winemaker? Were there any specific experiences or moments that led you to your journey and your passion for winemaking? Uh, I can tell you how I got started. Um, I, uh, I was studying for my sommelier exam in 2009, oh, wow. um, from 2009 to 2011, and I was working at a little wine bar on Mercer Island, and I, I there I, I was serving alongside of a, a gentleman named Joe Maglino, and he had started a winery called Marta D Winery a few years earlier, and he was just releasing his first thing. So he was doing Harvest and Crush that year, just like you know wineries do, and he invited me out, and at the time... I thought that anything that was going to help me articulate wine table side, because mm-hmm. that's the career path mm-hmm. that I was, I was thinking I was on, right. um, was was going to be the thing that I needed to do, just to give me an edge, line item on a line item on a resume, um, you know, it, just have a cool story to share table yeah. side maybe, and <clears throat> pardon me. And through that, I became a fairly committed volunteer at uh, at their winery. And eventually, in 2013, they gave me an opportunity to make some of my own wine in their space, which was very cool. Oh, wow. That's yeah. extraordinary. So that's kind of where the snowball started. Mm-hmm. That's and, cool. Yeah, it started with uh, literally one ton, a ton of grapes, uh, a ton of Syrah is what I got from Natchez Heights. And uh, it turned out pretty good. And so um, it's the next year I got a little bit more and then there was a little bit more and then a little bit more and it just kind of grew <laughs> so from old, there. Yeah. Finally, I had about 20 barrels of wine and Joe's like looking at me going, oh, are you going to do something with this <laughs> ever? Are you going to like keep adding to the stash? Like, what's up? So I, uh, in 2016, I got a license to, a uh, producer's license to sell. Oh, very good. Yeah. I want to just go back just a second there. You said a ton of grapes is what you had? Correct. The first one? Yeah. How many, how many bottles do you get out of a ton of grapes? Just... For oh, fascination's sake, just roughly. Uh, it's about 50, just over 50 cases. Okay. I think I got about fi- somewhere between 53 and 56 cases. Mm-hmm. I can't remember. Yeah. I was, I just, all, thought it'd it was be just fun. short of a pallet. Yeah, I thought it'd be fun for the listeners to kind of, you know, visualize what, I mean, a ton of grapes is a lot, but how much you actually get from that. It's probably not as much as people think, right? 50 cases. What's well, 50, 50 times 12. So what's that? 600? Yeah. Six, 600 divided by 9 is how many liters of wine that is, okay. right? You're not asking me to do math right now, are you? Uh, no, I hope not. So. <laughs> me either. I was just interested. I've got an app for that. <laughs> I was just interested just because like, it out there. a ton of grapes seems like a lot. I'm like, okay, what's you know what's the production point from that? But anyway, that was just a side note. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> I mean that's that's really what's that's really what got me going. Um, it was it was what very. What was the name of the winery again? Uh, Martiti. Martiti. Uh, everybody calls around? it Martetti. Yeah, they're they're still around. They're over right across from the cut shop. Oh, Is that yeah. w- little weird chain link fence? Yes, like yes, it's yes. If you're if you're standing at the cut shop door and you just left and you just left and it's like literally. Okay. Yeah, I've seen they've got uh, I've seen their a boards out. Yeah. Yeah, they uh, they took over um, JM's production space, production space. which okay. was formerly uh, Delil's production space, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Long time ago. Sounds like they do a lot of wine then. It's a big space. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah, it's a cool spot. Oh, okay. But it was. But it's not about them. It's about you. Yeah, no. 
it's, it's about, today's <laughs> no, about today me. is all about you. <laughs> today is all about right. me. That's so then you, so you got your license to produce. So then, what happened from there? Yeah, I was very much hobby status um, for for a number of years, just for you know, 2016, 17, 18. You know, I I was either making or bottling like 50 ish cases. Like it wasn't it wasn't a lot. It wasn't enough to to do winery at scale uh, by any means. And in in 2018, I I started. I got uh, how do I say this? Um, I I got a deal, or I wanted to. Just, I wanted to throw my hat in the ring of like trying to create a brand, right? Mm -hmm. uh. And so I created this little brand called Hashtag Cabernet, and it was for um, it was for a grocery store. And the, I sent him a I, I sent him a sample bottle. I got some sample some sample wine um, from uh, from a bulk producer. Packaged up bottle. Got a got a, um, a, a an inexpensive label on there and sent it off and says like, hey, how do you how do you feel about um, uh, buying some of this wine from me? I just want to create this brand, and you, mm -hmm. maybe you could stock it on your shelves. And they were like, "Sure, send us two, send us two hundred cases." And you had fifty. I had zero oh. of that. Of that, I had zero. So I like very quickly ordered all of this stuff to make it, and I turned it around and got it into their warehouse in uh, in about two and a half weeks. Wow! And uh, it kind of opened my eyes. Yeah, it was it was crazy. Um, kind of opened my eyes, and uh, I was like, "Wow, this is really something to this wine business thing." I think I can, I think I could probably do more of that. Sound a little bit like a crash course in how do we get this? Yeah, done. that's cool. Yeah, yeah, it was it was pretty cool. So, mm -hmm. um, I uh, I left the restaurant industry at that time, and um, kind of started going further and further into mm -hmm. uh, into winemaking and mm -hmm. try to make the try to make sin sellers um, sustaining. Right. For, for me. Okay. All right. Well, before we jump into the next question, should we I talk opened a bottle of wine while he was talking. I know you did, and I already had two. a sip. And I did you like, have a sip? I, yeah. Oh, damn, we're <laughs> skipping ahead. Well, you know, I'm listening to Isaac. I'm enjoying his wine while he's yeah. talking. Okay. This one's called Superiority Complex, and it's a Walla Walla Valley, Colum uh, yeah, Columbia, Cabernet Sauvignon from Walla Walla Valley, 2020 Vintage. Mm-hmm. I haven't had any yet, but oh, um, you need to. It's yeah. dark and inky. It, I know the color of it is just so rich looking, and the taste is just. <sighs> I don't really know what to say about it other than it's good. Yeah. It has a, a thickness to it that is, um, and I don't mean that in a, in a negative way. It just kind of sits on the tongue, and the flavors just kind of burst all over my tongue. It's that one's got more blackberries and stuff for mm -hmm. me. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Currants, cassis, blackberries, yeah. mm -hmm. bramble, like it, all of it. Yeah, dark fruit, a little Mary bit of earth. Yep. All the same thing. Yeah, yep. I'm tasting kind of the um, the blackberries, but also the currant in there, mm. which is an kind of unusual taste to to pick out. But um, it's it's a little more drying on the tip of my tongue than the other one was. Yep. But the flavors are super intense. Both of these wines last a long time in your mouth. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think they. I think yeah. I think I think that's accurate. I think they both have a pretty decent finish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for um, sure. I to your point, Pamela. Uh, the the Walla Walla. If we're if we're talking about the fancy areas in Washington State, we can kind of agree that like Red Mountain is yeah. one, and Walla Walla might be the other one. Um, I personally gravitated towards Walla Walla. Mm -hmm. I think that Walla Walla has this richness of fruit and richness of flavor that. Uh, is tough to get in other regions. It's not to say that the other regions are, you know, bad or whatever. Yeah. Um, they're uh, they're amazing, actually. But uh, the uh, there's just something special about Walla Walla Cab. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's it's a little more. Um, does it get hotter down there? Is that why it has a little more? Like the skins might be harder. Not and like really. Pulls really. No, mm -hmm. not really. I think something that's important is the uh, the average age of the vines. Oh yeah. That's. I, and so the the vineyards there, some not all of them. It's the ones that I pull from are a little bit more established. Like these these vineyards here were, um, they were planted by Greg Basil in 1996. Yeah. So they're 20 set uh, Basil cellars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, kind of an iconic winery in our area for a long time, um, but uh, this was part of the uh, part of one of their vineyards. Um, so I was I was pretty happy when I was able to get into get into this vineyard. I bet it's yeah. it's good. It is good. It's really good. Yeah. 
I feel quite honored that we've got to taste two different ones on air today. I know. That's really good. Can I do a quick shout out for my vineyard? Of course. For it's sure. Called, it's called Aria Vineyard. Dave will be happy. Aria. Aria. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We'll tag yeah. them when we do our social media. Remind cool. me. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, um, yeah. I'm, I don't want to say I'm pleasantly surprised because I'm not, but it just... I'm just like, okay, I don't know if I want to do any more. I just want to sit here and drink this wine. It's just, <laughs> it's really delicious. I, I can't emphasize that enough. It's it's good. Thank you. Wine Enthusiast gave me 93 points for this wine. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations I got, a, on I got a silver at uh, San Francisco International Wine Competition for wow. this one as well. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, well it was cool. Yeah. Thank All you. Right. Yeah. All right, let's, um, let's talk about Cintellas a little bit more, um, and more specifically kind of the crafting of your wines. Now, um, I would kind of say, in my own words, I, I feel like your winery is a little bit more of a boutique style winery, right? Um, and there's a number of reasons for that, but I want to kind of just talk about the crafting of the wines a little bit more because you have done something that maybe some others haven't done, which is trying to make your wines a little bit more accessible to those people who have sensitivities or reactions to wines. So for anybody that's listening, you might be thinking, what am I talking about? There are, there are some people that love wine, I'm one of them, um, but they have an adverse reaction to them, right? Yeah. Whether that is you get a headache after drinking it, or you feel tired after drinking it, or you know your sinuses flare up, or whatever that is, everyone's different. But you, you know, you wanted to make sure that your wines are a little bit more accessible to those people potentially um, that have reactions. So can you tell us a little bit more about you know what was the decision? that led you to tackling this issue and what challenges you faced creating the wines with it, with that goal in mind. Um, yeah, and what strategies you employed for making that wine? Because I think it's a unique thing that we should really talk about. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to share some of this stuff because I haven't really, beyond the beyond the tasting room, I haven't really done much. But um, in, uh, in 2018, when I started building uh, since sellers a little bit more, mm -hmm. um, I, I realized that I just, I wanted to perform better personally, like, mm -hmm. uh, mentally and physically. So I started reading a bunch of health books and, and, and podcasters and just kind of did what I could to be a bit more intentional about what I put in my own body as mm -hmm. far as like what I ate and drank. Mm -hmm. So that really led me to like, okay, well, what's, <laughs> what am I doing for, for work and what's the product that I'm creating? And, um, it led me to uh, inflammation, which is, I think, the probably a, a, a common denominator of a lot of the diseases of aging. Um, and so I started looking at winemaking through the lens of, of like, w okay, what, what could be or what is in wine that's inflammatory. It's like, okay, I get it. I'm making, I'm making a, a, an alcoholic beverage. Yeah. But if you know, I'm pursuing this this thing of you know trying to be a bit better uh, personally. Then, like, what does my product look like? What what do I want to put out there? And <clears throat> and so, what does it look like for me to make a better wine? Like, I again, like I said, it's it's alcohol. I get it's already got like it's some brand of of in, of inflammatory. But uh, concurrently, all these uh, over the years, like I've heard this this conversation, you know, that, that, that sounds like I can have whites, but I can't have reds. Mm -hmm. I can have reds from France, but I can't have reds from the United States. I think it's tan and I think it's sulfites. I don't know. And it's always nagged at me. So those two things kind of put together, uh, I, I started, you know, kind of experimenting with a, a couple different winemaking techniques. I started using filtration, um, and I started experimenting with different yeasts. And it led me to developing a protocol for, for winemaking that I think makes the wines uh, a bit better for, for, uh, for humans physiologically. Oh, that's awesome. It's, it's tough. It's, it's really hard to... He's a mad scientist. Of <laughs> <laughs> it makes a really good product. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, it, it's tough to... I can't. I, I feel like I can't really say some words mm -hmm. because they're sensitive yeah. to no, like get it. regulating authorities. Mm -hmm. um, but I truly think I have made something special. Yeah. Well, the fact that you even decided that that was something you wanted to look at, right? So um, there's a need there for some people that 
you know, maybe shying away from some wines and not getting the opportunity to enjoy them because there there's that barrier for them that yeah. could have an, a reaction to them. Um, but that's not to say that any of the other wineries are doing anything wrong. It's just that some people have, you know, this reaction. You clearly would make, or not clearly, but potentially something was happening with you um, that made you want to decide to kind of look at that in a little bit more depth for that inf- anti-inflammatory kind of thing. Yeah, I started noticing when it, it's it's funny when you become aware of something that you weren't aware of before and, and the fact that it, you can change it. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what started happening to me with wine. And I started noticing, like, I'm very low on the spectrum of sensitive, but I started noticing that with some wines, I would get very sleepy, mm-hmm. like heavy eyes, like couldn't put together a sentence to save my life. Mm-hmm. And other wines did. too much. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Just, just busted in, sorry. Yeah. Um, the uh, and some wines didn't do that to me, and I was, mm-hmm. I, you know, I was just kind of, I always wondered why. I was like, okay, yeah. well, you know, maybe I wasn't. We always blame it on like, oh, I wasn't hydrated, you know, I didn't eat anything today, and you know, yeah. whatever, whatever excuse mm-hmm. or whatever thing that we we make up. Um, but uh, I, a- after after going through all this experimenting and you know trying different things to uh, to either eliminate or uh, maybe a different way to process or ferment um, it seems to have been helpful with that right. like I don't I don't experience that anymore at least with my wines that's great yeah. yeah yeah so you take your wine through a specific process that helps it to be more palatable to people who have wine sensitivities yes Did I say that correctly yeah that would be that would be a real good way to say that I think okay Cool. That's awesome. Yeah. To differentiate yourself that way. Yeah. yeah. But then your wine is accessible to everybody, whether they have yeah. sensitivities oh, yeah. or not. And it it's, tastes... it's a good product. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. no, not everybody's sensitive. I mean, you know, it could be, like you mentioned, kind of that aging process of your body, like something that you were fine with in your 20s, maybe not so much in your 30s, 40s, 50s. You know, we, we change as we age. So sure. I yeah. think that um, just the aspect is a little bit more accessible for, for everybody. Yeah. yeah, the age-old traditional winemaking techniques, you know, how, how do you balance that with some of the innovations um, in winemaking and, you know, try and stick to um, your true north, per se? The, well, I, I don't really do a whole lot that's, like, sh- straight away from traditional winemaking. Uh, you know, it's, you get the fruit in, it, it ferments, and <laughs> it, you put it, you, you squish it, you squish off all the... All the juice you put it in barrel, then you put it in bottle. That's yeah. that's essentially how to do it. I've, way, what I've, o- way oversimplified. Yeah. <laughs> I, yes, it is. Yeah, that's it right, is. but it's actually more complicated than you think. Yeah. You can't just go and make a good bottle of wine yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah, no, that There's um, some skill involved there. A little, Three or little four bit. years and, later, and you might get your product. Yeah. Muscle, sweat. Yeah. Some crying here and there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, there are, um, uh, wh- 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 sorry, I got, t- we got totally derailed. We got sidetracked. Yeah. Got totally uh, just derailed. the kind of just tradition of winemaking versus the innovations that you're using, how are you kind of connecting those, or is there any differences, really? Yeah, the, I, I think that I do a few things real different. Um, I I basically took the, the all the winemaking tools in the toolbox and kind of took a step back and looked at them and go, okay, well, what's what's working and what's not working um i think that it's it's okay to like have fun and try new things and experiment uh you know different yeast you know whatever like there's a lot of there's a lot of cool technology that winemakers can use there's there's, um, all kinds of additives that we can put in this put in wine to enhance mouthfeel flavor aroma stuff like that um there's different techniques for you know fining or uh or or you know different yeast for fermentation and stuff but I think that at some point you got to take a step back and, and go, you know, like what's working, what's not working and why is, what's your version of working and not, you know, and that's, that's really what I did. And, um, so I found, I found a few, I found a few things, a few things came on my radar, uh, in regarding to uh, winemaking and, uh, histamine mm-hmm. was one. Mm-hmm. That was a big one. Um, mold or fungal bacteria. Uh, that was another really, really big one. 
And the one, the, the, the obvious one is, you know, the organic uh, sulfite, low sulfite or no sulfite, natural wines, that kind of stuff. That's kind of the one that's been um, trending, I think, lately for, for that uh, for Everyone that talks about sulfites. I don't know if I've yeah. heard anyone talk about a histamine. Histamine? Yeah. Uh, those are the things in, uh, it's an inflammatory compound. Okay. Um, it's, uh, your body makes it. And um, uh, bacteria actually make it as well. So what, what does exist out there is, uh, is yeast bacteria for fermentation that actually produce less um, biogenic amines than okay. other bacteria. So I found uh, a pre-ferment yeast and a uh, primary ferment yeast that I, that I use that, uh, that produce less histamine. Okay. Yeah, that I sounds know. good, actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I want to go back to your comment there about the sulfites. So, you know, yeah. when I noticed there was a, a change in my reaction to wines, and I was talking to somebody in the wine industry, and I said, well, you know, I think it's the sulfites in the wine. I was categorically told, no, it's, it can't possibly be that. I'm like, well, I'm the one with the headache, but you know. Um, <laughs> well, there but, is sulfates in everything. But well, there is, but whether that whether that was the reaction that yeah. was causing the problem, but the the histamine makes a little bit more sense and. Um, before I found out about your wines, if I was going to go wine tasting, I would actually take an antihistamine before going to help with some of Antihistamine. An antihistamine, yeah. 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 Did that help? A little, yeah. A little? Okay. A little, yeah. So, um, but yeah, I was just kind of on your note where people say, well, it's the sulfites in wine. It, it could be for some people, but not always. Right. You know, the histamine, because it's a reaction that you have, it makes a little bit more sense. I think that it's more than anything, like, we... we we want to take like the thing, whatever it is. We want to like understand it, articulate it, put it in a bucket, and then put it on the shelf and yeah. go. You know, this I understand that thing yeah. now, right? <laughs> like that's that's it's definitely the histamine. I can, yeah. you know, check when, my box. Yeah, yeah. check exactly. <laughs> and you, I don't think that we can really do that yeah. anymore. Mm -hmm. It's with uh, with this kind of stuff. It's 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 almost always a compound problem. Yeah. It's like. It's like okay if you're if you have sensitivities to a bunch of things right like you get up in the morning you take your dog for or for a walk through like grasses and trees mm -hmm. right then you go visit your friend who's got a cat then you go to lunch and you have uh, processed food at the restaurant mm -hmm. um, and then you go like later on wine tasting with your friends and you break out in something and you're like oh it's the red wine yeah you know and that's actually it it sounds like a compound, compound effect hold, yeah. hold on like, <laughs> yes. you did all those other things it's, right it's are like you a, blaming my wine no yeah, it's, it's like a load issue yeah. No, like you I, don't throw away your blender because you had the microwave and the hair dryer and uh -huh. like yeah. going all of a sudden you're like oh stupid blender yep exactly I like that analogy yeah. yeah you know you're right though it's it's all those other environmental factors that could play a part in it but yeah. I just appreciate that you've kind of taken a little different approach to it and kind of factored some of that in for people yeah well, you got to be different there's how many wineries here in Woodville 130 130 150 yeah. 170 yeah. I hear different numbers all the time yeah me too. You've got a different product. You're right here in the warehouse district. Uh, just really invite people to come out and visit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, come on out. Yeah. yeah. All right. I have a little bit of an ambiguous question here. Sure. So, you know, I'm going to throw it out there anyway. So can you kind of briefly walk us through your wine make making process at Zinzilla's? Now, you know, are there, I can ask you if there's particular methods or ingredients and practices that set your wines apart. Clearly there is. And obviously, you're not going to tell us the secret sauce of what's going on, right? <laughs> Don't um, give away the farm. So, yeah, exactly. That's the secret it's, stuff right there. It's giving away the farm. But let, so let's take a slightly different tag on this then. So kind of so people can understand maybe the timeline of creating a bottle of wine. Let's, let's do that instead. I'm going to you know, kind of go off at a tangent just a little bit so people can understand that, yes, you've done all of this research and whatnot, but... You know, what, what does the timeline look like? When does the process start for a bottle of wine? I don't think well, we've ever asked that question before. No, and he can, you can articulate some things that you might do differently. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, there's a, a lot of the stuff that I do is, um, or or get, like I'm not using some like secret yeast that nobody else has or can get or anything like that. It's, it's, it's pretty commercially available. Um, I think the difference between what I do is I do it, I, what, I, what I've done is intentional and it's repeatable. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's many wineries out there that probably have, um, unbeknownst to them maybe, uh, a similar product or like they just accidentally did it or just, you know, it, what I've done though, like I said, is I, I think I've done it, um, like I said, more, <laughs> more intentionally and, and the process is repeatable, which is very cool. Uh, I know what I'm doing to achieve an effect, basically. Right. Um, but to answer your question, the uh, the process for 
for making a bottle of wine. It starts uh, actually right uh, right now. This is the season. Right now we're in harvest and crush, and uh, many of us are getting. I've uh, already gotten a bunch of fruit in, so it starts with crushing the grapes, and from there, how how, how detailed do you want me to get? I would say it starts with vineyard management. Okay, just throw that out there, Troy. Okay. <laughs> no, well, yeah. I mean, okay. you, you, good point. Winemakers got to look at the grapes and determine when to harvest them. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, I agree. I, I also rely on my farmers sure. to, to share. I mean, we, Sure, those are the vineyard managers. Yeah, 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 for sure. Okay, so you get your grapes in, you stomp them. Starts them. in the vineyard, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Sorry. How they get grown, the amount of sunshine, the amount of water, yep. Yeah, I, I just wanted to be a smart dog. <laughs> you wanted to be what? A smart dog. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so yes, we, we get the fruit in, and we crush the, we crush the grapes, and... For me, I, uh, I don't do a cold soak. I go right into a pre-ferment yeast. And specifically one of these, the, this pre-ferment yeast that I use, it's, uh, uh, there, I read a research paper that came out of uh, Spain or Portugal or something a while back. And this, uh, it's a non-saccharomyces yeast that seems to be very good at outpopulating fungal bacteria. So um, those are like, that's the nice way to say mold. You don't um, want those in your wine. No, you don't. Um, <laughs> uh, Asper <laughs> Aspergillus, Fusarium, and Penicillium, those are the ones that live in North America. Uh, and they produce what's called uh, mycotoxins, um, aflatoxin and ochratoxin. Ochratoxin is the one that is in uh, a lot of our craft beverages, like agricultural product beverages, um, because mold is everywhere. And okay. um, let's it's, just it's clarify, we're not of... trying to scare anybody off. Yeah, yeah, yeah wine. No, you know, it's... these are just, you know, they're just facts of winemaking. Yes, thank you. And you <laughs> use a yeast that is prone to not making those bad things. Um, well, or what not... it what it does is it, uh, it's like, imagine three dogs going for the same food bowl, yeah. right? Like maybe the little one doesn't right. get to eat right away. Um, so the, uh, if there is uh, mold or fungal bacteria that exist on those grapes, then uh, the occurrence of the, the mycotoxin production is lower. Gotcha. In theory, right? Um, so I think that that's, that's, first, that that's the first thing that I do that's probably a little bit different, a little bit more intentional. Um, the second thing I just normal is like I go right into primary fermentation after it uh, hits about 3 or 4% alcohol maybe. Um, and uh, what's very cool is both of these yeasts were, uh, were also cultivated to, like we talked about earlier, produce less biogenic amines than, than, mm -hmm. other, than other yeast strains, um, which means histamine, right? So, uh, the, uh, so we're, from the, right from the get, we're, we're kind of canceling out or, or mitigating the, the fungal bacteria that's, that's in the that's in the, the in the grape must and then we're you know canceling out or reducing the the the, the occurrence of maybe histamine during primary fermentation um, and then additionally the uh, the malolactic if I if I choose to use malolactic uh, yeast then that one also is by the same we'll say brand of yeast that uh, produces less biogenic amines um, and that process is about two weeks? Uh, two to three weeks, yeah, okay. for primary fermentation. Okay. It's generally about how long it lasts, and we press it off and you know, put so it in the So you're busy. Barrel. you yeah. got to be testing and running and... Yep, yep. I go pick up all my own fruit, too. So oh, you do? I, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I've got a truck and trailer, and I, I drive to Eastern Washington and pick it oh, all wow. up. Yeah. Wow. See? Boutique. He's the wine maker <laughs> and the truck driver. And, and the, yeah, the everything. Yeah, I understand well, that, being a small business. Yeah. Wow. That's great. Yeah. No, I mean, just, I, th I don't think people really understand, unless they've helped out with a harvest or a crush, it, what it takes to actually get a bottle of wine onto the table. Yeah, and then yeah. from there it goes into, um, into rest, either a barrel or stainless steel vat, right? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much, it, it you know I'll rest it for uh, it goes in a barrel for I landed on about eighteen to twenty four months. Okay, seems to be the the sweet spot. Right. I don't think it. I mean, you could you could argue that there's a you know maybe a 
in some countries or in some in some regions of the world that they will you know choose to age their wines you know three four five years in barrel mm -hmm. before they bottle it um, tend to get a little oaky they they can get a little oaky um, regardless of uh, of of sulfites or adding sulfur to the wine to you know keep to, to reduce bacterial populations in barrel um, stuff still grows mm -hmm. and it, it can grow and if it if it does and if it, it can produce the ochre toxin that I think that some people are sensitive to I think it's like a twofold sensitivity I think um, I think there's some people that are you know sensitive to the microorganisms themselves and then there's other people that are like super uber sensitive to like what that that compound is um, towards the end of the of the barrel aging process right before bottling I use a uh, a, a microfiltration on the wines that yep. uh, filters down to 0 0.2 microns which uh, filters out everything uh, anything microbial anything bacterial really I think is 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 what it does it sounds like in the barrel longer could have be prone to more problems than having the wine go bad on you even, right? Yeah. If you're if someone is sensitive, like if you if you go to the allergist and they, they might tell you like don't eat the leftovers that are, you know, two days old in the fridge. Oh, it's gotcha. kind of the same idea and I don't mean to be gross or anything like that. Like this is it's like oh, let's talk about mold. Um, <laughs> I've cut mold off my cheese before. Yes. Yeah. 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 You can Doesn't do everyone that. do that? Um, you know, I didn't, sidebar, I didn't think you could do that, but my uncle actually used to work for a huge cheesemaker in yeah. the United Kingdom. And um, one day I was like, oh, I keep having to throw my cheese out because it's got mold on it. He's like, you just cut it off. <laughs> you just cut it off. Tough to do with a barrel of wine. Yeah. Yeah, this yeah, is true. It's tough to do that. <laughs> it's tough to do that. Uh -huh. Anyway, before, um, <laughs> before we got sidetracked onto cheese and mold. Um, so it's 24 <laughs> months, say, in the longest in barrel. And then from there yeah. it goes, uh, it gets bottled you know, you, what do you do with the barrels over those 24 months? Uh, you, just normal, normal maintenance. We had we had to top them, you know, every every other month, every two or three Does months they or something like that. Evaporate? Uh, yeah, there's a little bit of evaporation that almost always happens. Right. So, you spend some time topping them off. You you know re up on on maybe a little bit of SO2 okay. uh, sulfites if you if you need to. Um, How but, often uh, do you rack your wine? Uh. Two, probably two, three times. Yeah, probably two times. Okay, reacting means changing, taking it from one barrel, putting it into an empty barrel, and then letting it sit for a while. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, did I learn something else today? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow, fascinating. But so, what can what wines do you currently offer for your wine fans? You know, and what can they expect for your next release? And when will it be? So my next release is in November, mm -hmm. and I'm going to be releasing my 2021. Petit Verdot, oh. which is amazing. I just tasted it the other day. I like Petit Verdot. Yeah. Um, my Bill last trip. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the other thing that I'm going to be releasing is the uh, 2021 uh, Del Toro Tempranillo. Okay. Yeah. So the, uh, the 2020, 2020 that we're, today? yeah, this okay. is, this is club only stuff oh. for right now. And I, I put, I actually put whatever's left in kind of in, in library mode. Gotcha. Um, so it's actually, so you can try it years yeah, from now. You can try it years from now. Nice. Yeah. So what else can people taste at your tasting room? I've got a uh, I've got a cab from uh, Walla Walla. I've got a Merlot also from Walla Walla. I have a smoky Syrah, and I have a, uh, a rosé of Syrah as well. Cool. That's kind of it for right now. Now the rosé was quite um, quite bright in color, if I remember rightly. Yeah, I, uh, I I I I allow a little bit of skin contact. Yeah. On the rosé. Just because I'm a texture guy, anyways, I like a little. I like to know it's there. Yeah. So um, I think that with a little bit of skin talk, skin contact, not too much, uh, it picks up a little bit extra color and a little bit extra mouthfeel, which mm -hmm. I, like I said, I, I I really enjoy. Yeah, I think if I, when we when we went over to the tasting yeah, room, the we rose, commented was, on that. Yeah, the the color of it was just it was quite interesting and quite it was fun. It was, it was like it had some vibrancy yeah. to it. it. wasn't It wasn't just touched with the rosé. It was really. Yeah. I know you can have some rosés that look like white wine. Yeah. When you're like, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and this was definitely that a real bridge between a red and a white. It was just it wasn't just, quite Pinot, but no, but it was yeah. I hadn't seen anything like it. Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit darker. It, it yeah. was tasty. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So yeah, people go down. Yeah. 
scoot on over to the warehouse district. Yeah, well, we'll give all the details of where um, where we can find Sin Cellars shortly, but I think you've got one more question, Troy. I do, I do, and we always ask this of our guests, you know, just uh, being in the Woodenville community, what are some of the things that you love to do, some hidden gems, restaurants, favorites that you enjoy and maybe frequent? Um, in, in Woodenville. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be just Woodenville. Our just our community in general. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that... Uh, the, okay. You know, I, I I meet my buddy at Bricks. Okay. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the food is pretty yeah, good there. <laughs> the food's pretty good. Um, I think it's uh, it's affordable. It's it's not it doesn't hurt. It is. Doesn't, doesn't, pretty, doesn't hurt the pocket. It's pretty it's reasonable. Super, it's right downtown yeah, Woodville, Wooden Creek. Incredibly reasonable. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's mm-hmm. it's good food and and the staff there is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, the ambiance is good. I've yeah. I've only been the once, and I was very impressed with it. The reason we ask is, you know, because obviously our listeners are, are listening to the show to find out more about our community. You know, yep. your winery wines are just, you know, maybe there's somewhere they haven't heard of before. You know, if you haven't been to Breaks, try it. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Mm-hmm. Give it a go. Yeah. You want me to come up a you couple might. more? If you have I don't them. If you have them, yeah. yeah. Gosh, let's see. Um, we. I think for Red Mountain, Obelisco is probably one of my favorites. As far as winery? As far as winery okay. goes. Okay, yeah, I haven't been in there forever. Place. That's in uh, Apple Tree yeah, they do Village really or something like that? They've got, a, they've got a location in Warehouse Park. Oh, they do? Actually, yeah. But oh. they're also a, over Hollywood Roundabout. Yeah. they got a little spot there. Um, WT. He does, Jeff does some pretty cool stuff over okay. there. Okay. Yeah. Haven't tried that. Yeah. Mm. Want to add to the list? I'm just adding, you know, as we go through these shows, I'm adding lists of 130 of them. We haven't, we don't have that many podcasts out yet. So yeah, not yet. We've got well, more to go through. Yeah, the wineries, but the restaurants, the shops, yeah, you know, yeah. whatever it is. So, all right, well, this has been absolutely fascinating. We're not quite done yet, but we are going to take a really quick break. And while we take a break, we're going to uh, drink some more of Isaac's amazing wine. And we'll be right back. Yes. After this. Thanks. <laughs> 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 Hello, listeners. I have a new go-to place in town, Vaughn's 1000 Spirits, Woodenville, West Valley, just across the street from Janik Winery, Seattle's famous sourdough pizza and pasta. My favorite is their Northwest King salmon pasta. Comes with San Juan Island mushrooms, Sicilian spice, lemon, and cream sauce. Their bar has one of the biggest selections of fine spirits around. Do you know about the waggering wheel? Go during happy hour. It's super fun. There's a lively bar, dining room, and a huge patio. Did I mention they won Best Burger in Washington for 2023? Free valet parking daily. Go check them out. Welcome back to TLC, 10 Life Community Podcast. We have had a fantastic show so far with Isaac from Sin Cellars. We've been enjoying two bottles of his wine. Um, Not fully, though. There's still some wine left. Man. Yes, not yet. We haven't finished them, but there's still time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we appreciate that conversation. And um, But before we kind of round things out, we do have to tackle our real estate roundup. Are you ready yes. for this, Troy? Yes. What do you got for me today? Okay. So every week we ask Troy a question that is real estate related. So you ready? I th- Okay. I'm not going anywhere. This right. wine is right here. It's good. I know. You're sticking yeah. to the table? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, <laughs> so should, you know, we hear a lot of things about the different demographics of who's buying homes and who isn't. You know, there's a lot of talk about um, Gen Z is kind of the, you know, 34-year-olds are the ones buying houses right now. But let's talk mm-hmm. about a different demographic. Let's talk about the baby, bo- baby boomers. Um, should a baby boomer buy or rent after selling their house? Well, I guess it depends. You know, that's all. That's a great answer, right? No. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> be, be specific. Um, if you're staying in the same area, I would. Uh, my opinion is you should buy because you. The minute you jump out of real estate, you lose that uh, leverage for um, appreciation um, potential, and um, gaining value that way. Um, if you're going to a new area that maybe you don't have family, you haven't visited with before or visited at before, it might be a good idea to, you know, pick a place that you think you might want to live and maybe rent for a little bit. But rents have been on the rise, well, for pretty much forever, but they're up pretty astronomically since 1988, which was, what, 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. They go up every year. Some years they plateau, like this year, they're starting to plateau a little bit, but 
they're they're going to continue to go up. I mean, the expenses keep going up. Landlords, the, the taxes go up. So all of that is an, has an effect on rents. Yeah. So, I mean, renting is definitely a great idea to explore areas that you're not quite sure of before you pull the trigger on making a big investment like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Well, just kind of the median price of renting from 1988 was around $350. That's not for this yeah. area. This is across the country. And now they're talking that in 2023, the median price is 1450 yeah. Obviously, it's more expensive in this area, in, but it just gives, area, you, yeah. gives you an idea of that, you know, how much it's actually grown. So, okay, so you've, you've rented for a little bit in an area because you're exploring, but, you know, so renting might not be the right idea because you're, you're not going to have stability in your, um, you know, in, in what your expenses will be for housing. Right. You, the landlord can always raise the rent. The landlord might um, uh, want to move back in and not extend the lease, so you're right. forced to move. So you're you're basically lose lose some of your control mm-hmm. when you rent. Right. You know, you can't paint the rooms your color. Or, mm-hmm. You know, you might not be able to have pets. There's just a lot of limitations to renting, and it's not. Renting for a season is not a bad thing, I don't think. But um, if you're a baby boomer, you want to try and preserve your capital. I, I would, I would think, just because you, you know, you have less of an opportunity to get it back. So, yeah. keeping yourself invested in real estate, um, even if you rented for a while and bought an investment property someplace else, mm-hmm. you know, to just put that capital back to work for you. I mean, that, I'm, and I'm making some assumptions that there's they've sold a house and they've got a lot of equity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and also when you think about, you know, purchasing that new house, you, you usually get a fixed rate mortgage, right? I mean, yeah. we do have arms and stuff, but if you do the fixed rate, fixed rate mortgage, you do yeah, have Yeah, your stability. expenses stay the same. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So st- stability, you know, I mean, if you want stability, definitely take out a mortgage, a 30-year fixed. Um, yeah. If you're in that position where you have cash equity, you can yeah. buy it outright somewhere else. Well, so great. several years ago, um, I sold... Um, a client's house in Seattle, and then the daughter and the client bought a duplex together. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, as your parents are aging, or you know, as people are aging, there's definitely options. You know, you can have a mother-in-law type unit in the house. You can buy a duplex, live side by side, um, and still still maintain the the equity position. You know. Yeah. Well, so my answer is no. You should you should always own some real estate. Mm-hmm. And if you're not sure what to do, then obviously connect with a real estate professional. For sure. And guide For sure. you in the right direction. Every it, situation's unique. It is. And it also depends what market you're in. But like sure. locally, yeah. probably, um, you know, we, we've seen that rent prices are continuing to rise here. So. Yep. Okay. I don't see that changing. No. I, well, we've had this conversation before, right? They don't slide back the way. They always just keep climbing. So. <laughs> <laughs> like most things these days. So. Inflation's curbed, but uh, mm-hmm. it's, yeah, I don't see rent coming down. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's the answer to my question this week on whether baby boomers should rent or buy after they've sold a home. So, all right. Thank you for that, Troy. But um, thank most you importantly, everybody. thank you, Isaac, for coming yes. in and yep. sharing your wonderful wine with us. So before we finish out the show, please share with our listeners where they can find you, uh, your address, your website, any pertinent details you want to share. So, <coughs> pardon me. I'm in the warehouse park at uh, 19501 144th Avenue Northeast. Uh, I'm in the C building, C300. And uh, I'm open Friday, Saturday, Sunday, so I'll be open a little bit later today. Um, gosh, what else? If you want to know more about any of the stuff that I do uh, about the wine, please, please, please come in and ask because I'm happy to share. It's, it's so much fun for me to be able to share it. I'll even probably let you walk around and see things. <laughs> yeah. If I see your eyes glaze over, I'll stop too. No. <laughs> I, can, I can stop. I can, I can go for hours. All right. So if people want to um, connect with you, what's your website? Uh, www.sinsellers.com. Okay. Do you yeah. have uh, social media? I do. Uh, it's at sinsellers um, on S-Y-N-N-E. Instagram. S-Y-N-N-E. S-Y, yeah, sorry. At S-Y-N-N-E. C E L L A R S at uh, Instagram, and it's uh, Sin Dash Sellers on uh, on Facebook. Perfect. Cool. Now you yeah. have tasting room opportunity, you know, for people to come in and taste. Can people become wine club members with you? If so, absolutely, they can. Yep. Perfect. Want to make sure that if, we get uh, that in there. If you've got it, if you if you're sensitive to to red wine and you want to uh, do a little study of your own mm-hmm. for science, um, 
absolutely come on in. Um, I'm happy to I'm happy to chat with you about it. Yeah, and even if you don't have sensitivities, still go That's in and check one. it out. Yeah, great one. Yeah. 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 All right. So thank you, um, right, Troy? How do we get hold of you? Porch Founder. Oh, do not. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we changed it to Sunday Sipper. Sunday Sipper, yes. It's more <laughs> elegant and more appropriate for the show than Porch Pounder, which we did not have today. We definitely Just for did clarity. Not. Yeah, clarity. We did not. No, but I have to throw that word in. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Tendhometeam.com is where you find us, and um, Troy Anderson, and 206-504-3660, and that's tendhometeam.com, T-E-N-D. Perfect. So if you've enjoyed the show, um, please remember to like and subscribe and share with everybody that you know. We're available on all of the major podcast platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, ding the dinger. Yeah, which means like and subscribe. Yes, hit yep. the bell. <laughs> hit the bell. Like and subscribe. Thanks very much, Isaac. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll Thanks, see Isaac. you yeah, next time. Thank you. Time. Fascinating. Yeah, cool. Absolutely. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Okay, yep. bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Hey, you got to hear about this amazing spot I stumbled upon. Northwest Spirits Distillery. It's located right in the heart of Woodenville Wine and Spirit Country, near all the good stuff like Novelty Hill Janik and Chateau St. Michel. They've got the tastiest spirit flights, killer cocktails, and delicious Northwest grub from their sister restaurant, Vaughn's 1000 Spirits. The best part? It's a family-run business, going strong for five generations. They've got all sorts of fun events, too. Private bookings, trivia night, and even Bark and Bourbon, where you can bring your furry buddy along for the ride. How cool is that? Check out their website for the latest happenings. Seriously, don't miss out on this gem. Northwest Spirits is where the celebration is at. NorthwestSpirits.com.